God gets on that stove and starts cooking up something for you. So I, I want to, here's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you around the thought, eyes on the throne. You got to keep your eyes on the throne. Backstory, John chapter 4, go there in your Bibles. Backstory, woman's been married a lot of times. She's living in adultery. She feels ostracized, rejected. She's broken. She's lived a horrible life. She's fragmented. Her soul is wounded. Her thoughts toward herself are horrible. There was a certain time every day that women would go to the well of Jacob. It was a social hour while they were doing their duties. They would go there, get water, take it back to their home. She avoided that time. She went there when she thought nobody else would be there. Intentionally. That's the way a lot of broken people live their life. Avoiding people, situations, environments, because they don't feel that they're qualified for those environments. When God exposes you to certain environments, do you pull back or do you step in? Do you allow your emotions to disqualify you from what God is showing you to preview? I learned this a long time ago. When God begins to expose you to greater, he's giving you a preview into your future. But most people step away from it because they don't think they're qualified for it. But God doesn't qualify you based on pedigree. God qualifies you based upon your response to him. He'll come to you, he'll come to a woman like this one in John chapter 4. Been married a bunch of times, living an adultery in sin. He'll go out of his way to put himself in her path. What would seem as if going out of his way. It's a picture of Christ leaving heaven coming into our world. Oftentimes we think we have to do certain things before we can get into his world. It's impossible for you to get into his world without him first getting into your world. He stepped into her place so she could get into his place. He waited on her. She showed up. At the peak of their conversation, here's what he says to her in John 4, verses 21 through 24. Jesus said, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father. True worshipers will worship. If you find it hard to worship, That's a sign you need a fresh encounter. Do do you? That's a legitimate question. Do you find it hard to worship God? Are you more of a spectator? Or are you a real worshiper? Do you even know what worship is? If you're new around here, you're in the right place. I get it. I didn't understand it at first. I began to do it before I knew what what it was I was doing. You're in the right place. The best way for you to learn how to worship is to be around people that know how to worship. If for too long the church world has dumbed down and sugared down and stopped worship because they're afraid those that don't know God will be turned off by people that are passionate to worship. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. That's like saying, seeing somebody who's passionately in love as a turnoff. To somebody else that wants to fall in love. When you see somebody in love, it does something to those that want to be in love. It inspires you. So they will worship. You don't have to conjure. You don't have to coerce or manipulate. They will worship. They worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Now you may have heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again to remind you and for those that are new and hadn't heard me say it yet. I'm going to say it again. Now, there's nothing wrong with you seeking God. You should seek God. 
If you want to receive anything from God, you need to seek Him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If you don't go after Him, you're not going to receive anything from Him. Just sitting there passively is not going to get you your breakthrough. You're never going to go deep with God, encounter God, if you just own a Bible and sit there and never open it up, never get on your knees and never pray, never worship, never seek Him, don't get connected, don't plug in. You're not going to be what you have the potential to be. You're just going to wish you could be what you'll never be. But you're not the only one here that's seeking. God is here seeking. The Father is seeking those who will worship Him. That that just blows me away. Why God would have to seek anybody to worship Him. Have you ever read Isaiah chapter 6? And when you read Isaiah chapter 6, it describes all of the angels, the six-winged creatures that are flying, saying one to another, holy, 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 holy. Countless angels. John on the island of Patmos when he had been thrown there in isolation as a prisoner, quarantined to this horrible place. He had been bold in all, but they couldn't kill him. And he worships God on the Lord's day, and he gets caught up into the Spirit, and he sees an open door, and a voice invites him to come higher. When he responds to that invitation, he sees something he's never seen before. Worshippers see things that spectators will never see. In the moment, he's in the spirit, and he goes through this open door, and he sees. He sees thrones around the throne. He sees elders with crowns casting them at his feet as they fall prostrate before him. He hears a decree about how worthy the lamb is. He's watching all of this worship. All of the worship that is presently transpiring as we gather in this moment, but yet Somehow, he looks beyond all of that and he searches among us today for worshipers. Well, when he looks at you today, what does he see? Does he see a spectator or does he see a worshiper? He's looking, he's searching, he's seeking. So if he's seeking, that means he must not always be finding what he's looking for. He's seeking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And the emphasis is on worship. Eight times in four verses, the word worship is used. Oftentimes, people that are lukewarm, backslidden, complacent, say, oh, you don't have to do all of that. I'm a Christian. I do my version Bible app devotions every day. I ask God to bless me and my family before I leave the house. It's all about you. You're the center of all of your affection. I prayed for you today. You're either going to like it or run from it. But I prayed for you that you will have singleness of heart and singleness of mind as it relates to your pursuit of Him. How many of you get distracted Eddie preached about distractions. How many of you get distracted in times of worship? You, some of you right now, you're preoccupied. You're, you're, there, there are competing thoughts in your mind. Right now, right now. Some of you are thinking about where you may meet some other people later on this afternoon. You may think about some responsibilities you've got going on in your life. You may think about how you're going to pay some bills. You may be thinking about how bad you feel because of the sins you committed last night. All of that stuff competing, stopping you from focusing on Jesus and nothing else. Some of you are going to have a hard time. Some people would say what I'm about to say is too deep to say on a Sunday morning, but I won't say it. And some of you are going to have a hard time believing it because, because you, you, you're so far from it, you don't even think it's possible. But I'm going to tell you anyway it's possible. There is a place you can get to in your pursuit of God, in your worship, where where everything fades. I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I've been at a place where as a result of praying and worshiping and pursuing God, 
the, the, the location I was in, it faded away. It faded. How long I was there, I don't know. Time, time didn't matter. Time ceased to exist in that place. Even the position I was in, I was on my knees. I was, and, and I lost awareness. I was so aware that I was meeting with God face to face. I couldn't see his face because no man had seen his face and lived. But I was right there in his face. You can get there. God is not hiding from you. He's hiding, waiting on you. He's like, if you just, just come. Worship. Now, the main Greek word for worship, it means bow. It means bow. It means get on your knees. It means kiss. It means serve. When somebody gets on their knees, like it today, if they just got on their knees beside you and started worshiping, would that make you feel uncomfortable? Does that bother you? Do you have thoughts that flood your mind? Like that's just emotionalism. What goes through your mind when you see other people lay on their face before God? I saw people down here at the altar. They literally put their face on the ground. You know what getting on your knees is? It's an expression of humbling yourself. You know, David, David... David realized there's something wrong. There's something wrong in the temple. We're going through all these motions and God's presence isn't here. David's like, where's the presence of God? They said, we know where it's at. It had fallen into the hands of the enemy. And they had taken it because the enemy is like, because when you get God's presence in the midst of a habitually sinful life, it's going to convict you to repent, but if you don't want to repent, it's going to wreck your life. Some people get just enough Jesus to make them miserable. Have you ever seen people get saved and immediately they just get miserable? Because they didn't know getting saved meant let go of their sin. And now they got the Holy Spirit trying to live in adultery, trying to get drunk, and trying to be a liar, and trying to be unethical, and steal and cheat and do all that other stuff. And now you got Jesus up in the midst. And once you get saved, sin will never taste the same. And so when the enemy, like it, the, the enemy kept messing them up, they said, get this out of here. And so they put the, the presence of God, the ark in uh, Obed Edom's house. And so David went to get it, brought it back. I won't go into all that story. But when he's coming back into the city, he starts dancing. He starts dancing and twirling. Bible says he danced out of his clothes. Now he did have on an undergarment. He just wasn't nude going through the city. But he starts dancing and twirling bringing the presence of God back. His wife looks out the window of the palace and she looks at him in disgust and embarrassment. Those thoughts, I hope, don't go through your mind. When she saw David, she said, how disgusting were you, undignified were you today in the sight of all the people. Now, most people that are aware of the church world know what kind of church we are. So, if you're new here, everybody's already seen you come here. So, you might as well just go with it because they already think you're one of us. And... And that's what the warfare is over. You, you've got to understand, do you know why you were created? The very reason that God put you on this planet was to be a worshiper. That's, that's his primary reason, to be a worshiper. Sometimes we try to complicate the will of God. It's, it's really a lot simpler than what most people want to make it. Because I promise you, if you will become a worshiper, he'll guide every footstep. He'll make sure you fulfill his will. It is impossible for a worshiper to worship in spirit and in truth. 
and end up somewhere on another country and another planet where you weren't even supposed to be there. How did you get here? I worshiped my way over. That, that, that doesn't happen. When you worship God, he guides you. He's looking for people that will worship him. So that's what the battle is over. Do you know that the very first act of murder was over worship? First act of violence that ever occurred was over, was over worship. It's Cain and Abel. Abel, Abel obeyed God. Cain wanted to do it his way. And that's where, that's where the majority of Christians are in America. Not everybody. God's got his remnant. But a lot of people like Cain, they just won't worship God the way they want to worship God. And they want God to bless them. God, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me. And if you don't bless me like you're blessing Abel, I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get mad. I'm going to get angry because I want you to bless me. And I don't want to do it the way you told me to do it. I want to do it the way I want to do it. And I want you to bless me when I do it. Because Abel did it the way God said. Abel offered up a blood sacrifice. Without, without the shedding of blood, there, there is no real, if there's not a sacrifice, it's, it's not real. There had to be the shedding of blood. And so when, he, when Abel offered up his sacrifice the way God ordained for it to be offered up, God blessed him. Somebody say, God blessed him. You know why God blessed him? Because he obeyed God. God blesses obedience. In this, in this age of people perverting the grace and love of God, coming up with an unbiblical, ungodly definition of what grace and love is all about, and they're using it as just a justification to live in lasciviousness and sinfulness and all kinds of perversion and evilness and drunkenness and revelry. And they're saying, isn't this great, the grace of God, the love of God empowers me to live the way my flesh wants to live. The Bible said there will come a day, and we're living in that day, where people's bellies become their gods. What is it talking about? It's not saying you'll look like Buddha. It's saying your appetites, your fleshly appetites, they are your gods. Two things, two things. If, if, if you find it hard to worship, number one, it could be a devil. Because the enemy don't want you to worship. Or number two, it could be that you keep feeding your flesh so much, your flesh is resisting the will of God. It doesn't want to be crucified. It doesn't want to be crucified. It wants a stimulus check. It don't want to sacrifice. The... the so, so God blesses Abel. You know how he blesses him? The heavens open up and fire falls out. Fire will never fall without a sacrifice. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Yeah, we're going to die. We're going to die so that we can live. We're going to die to our flesh. We're going to die to our will. We're going to surrender our life to it so we can live to the will of God. That's the kind of sacrifice that God pours his fire out on. And so God blesses Abel. Fire falls, consumes it. Cain gets angry. God comes down and has a talk with him. God says, Cain, if you do good, would I not be pleased with you? He said, don't you realize that sin lies at the door and its desires for you? Now, I've done a Hebrew study on that right there. Sin lies at the door and its desires for you. It says, it's like a wild banshee demon. The description behind it, I, I'm, not, I'm not paraphrasing, I, I'm giving you what the Hebrew says. It's a wild banshee demon waiting to prance on you. That's what happens when you want to do it your way. When you're just a Christian in name only. Because you know that's going to happen, right? That's going to happen to many. Matthew chapter, whatever it is. I think it's chapter 6. I can't remember. But he said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we've done all these things in your name. He's going to say, I don't know you. 
I, I know this isn't popular preaching. John the Baptist would have to have a tent in our culture. Because they're not going to invite John the Baptist to preach in today's churches. Because he's going to talk about sin and repenting. And there's an axe that God's got in his hand. And he's going to lay it at the root right now. I mean, he's not orthodox. He not, he's not, doesn't have the proper pedigrees or any of those other kind of things. But he's a forerunner. There will be no Savior without a John the Baptist. A John the Baptist prepares the way for the Savior. And so, so Cain gets angry, or Cain, Cain gets jealous, because Cain is not willing to do what Abel did, but he wants what Abel has, but he doesn't want to do what Abel did. He's like, God, I'm upset. And God's like, if you do good, I'll be pleased with you. And so the devil saw that jealousy as an open door. And too many Christians have open doors in their life. And that devil stepped in and fueled that anger and rage in him. And as he fueled the rage and the anger in him, he rose up and killed his brother. And then God said, what's that I hear crying from the ground? Cain, I'm hearing something. I'm hearing your brother's blood cry out. You know, blood has a voice, don't you? Sometimes we think we can murder people and get away with it. But that blood's crying out. Oh, you may not have murdered him with a gun or a knife. But sometimes we murder him with our tongue. So that's what the warfare is over. You know the devil wants you to worship him, don't you? I've met Satanists. And Satanism is huge. There's a lot of people that intentionally worship. They know it. They're, they're Satanists. They're, they're witches. They're warlocks. They, they live a Satanic life. They, they read the, their, their Bible, right? The, the book of whatever, Satan. They read it. And that's what the warfare's over. Lucifer, when you hear the name Lucifer, we all think Satan because Lucifer and Satan are the same people. It's just a different name, same person. But Lucifer used to be the most beautifully created angel in all of heaven. Scripture says that he was crowned with all these precious jewels. He had, he had emeralds and he had uh, rubies and he had diamonds and he had sapphire and he had all of these jewels on him. He was, he was built with them. He was covered in them. He, the scripture says he was a living instrument. He had in him, he had in him pipes, organ, strings. He was a living instrument. Theologians say when Lucifer, because he, he was the chief, he was an archangel, Three archangels in the Bible. You have Gabriel, he's an archangel. You have Michael, he's an archangel. Lucifer used to be an archangel. Gabriel is a messenger angel. Like when the messenger angel came to Mary, said, you're highly favored, chosen of the Lord, and he, he's just got his plan for you. And she said, be it to me according to your word. He's a messenger angel. He leads all the other messenger angels. Michael is a warring angel. He leads all the other warring angels. Lucifer was the head worshiping angel. He led all the other angels in worshiping God. He had, the, he had the highest ranking position that any body or angel could ever have in, in heaven. Right underneath God Almighty himself. When he would lead all the other angels in heaven, theologians said the glory of God would begin to shine and flow through him and have you ever seen light hit a precious jewel, a diamond or something like that, and all those rays of light come out of it? That's what theologians says, say what happened to Lucifer. He would begin to shine, and rays of lights would begin to come out of him all over heaven as all the angels are worshiping God. Lucifer's leading, leading all these other angels in worship, and he starts looking around. 
And he's like, we're giving him all this attention, but I'd like to have some of that attention. And then he, and then he says, I'm going to exalt myself above God. I want to be the one that's the center of attention. Rather than leading worship, he wanted to be worshiped. Do you have any of that in you? If you've got any of that in you, I'd encourage you, humble yourself before God and repent and ask God to get that out of you. Ask God to get, get that out. Ask God to put a genuine spirit of humility in you. Don't ask God to humble you. Ask Him to put a spirit of humility in you because humbling you and putting a spirit of humility is two different things because if He humbles you, He might embarrass you. If He humbles you, He may make you fall on your face in front of everybody. But a spirit of humility, it, it, it doesn't cause you to walk around as if you're worthless like a coward. It, it gives you the confidence that you need because you know you're completely dependent upon Him for everything. That's humility, knowing that I need Jesus. And believe me, if anybody knows I need Jesus, it's me that knows I need Jesus. Y'all wouldn't even want to see me if Jesus got away from me. Or if I got away from him. And so the devil wants you to worship him. So right when I first started preaching, I had this revival service. And, and God showed up one night in a way that would blow your mind. Now I'm going to tell you what happened. Some of you are not going to believe it. But I'm going to tell you anyway it happened. And a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an opinion. You, you can tell me what you've never experienced, but you can't tell me what I've never experienced. And so this night, the Holy Spirit came into this little church that was out in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. It was, it was nowhere. You didn't get there because it was convenient. You got there on purpose. And we were in this little church. I was preaching. Hadn't been preaching long. The Holy Spirit came into that church Nobody laid hands on anybody. The Holy Spirit laid a hand on everybody. The entire church got slain in the Spirit all at the same time. Everybody was out under the power of God except for me. I'm standing there looking around, and I'm getting ready to preach, but there's nobody to preach to because they're all slain in the Spirit. And there was this bench on, this, on the platform. I just went and sat down and worshiped God while they're all slain in the Spirit. When revival breaks out, some people run from revival because it messes up their life. It doesn't fit within an hour and a half time slot on a Sunday. Because some people, like this, like Jesus said to this woman, some people say we worship here and some people say we worship there. They limit worship to that place, place and time. Real worshipers don't lock themselves in to a place in time. Yeah, we assemble in a place. But worship doesn't stop with the place. And we don't limit what God does to a time. And, and so, revival broke out. It was before social media. Revival broke out in this little church and it came from everywhere. They packed it out. Well, I didn't know this. But there was a coven of Satanists that met in a pasture. And they had this huge tree where they would have animal sacrifices and they had an altar. That was real close to where this church was. And they literally would lay naked on this altar and hang like cows and bulls. And they would cut them open and let their intestines run out on them as they would take these blood covenants in Satanism. Well, when revival broke out, they sent some witches to that revival. You to go there and mess it up. Now, we think Satanists look like God. But these Satanists, these witches that showed up look just like you. Matter of fact, most witches I've ever met, most Satanists I've ever met look like you. Just nice looking people. 
And then all of a sudden, the glory of God showed up. Showed up. This one revival break, broke out. Glory of God shows up. Two, two witches. One jumps up and runs out the door. She couldn't handle the glory of God. The Bible said the wicked shouldn't be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous. She ran out the door. Took off running. Never saw her again. The other witch jumped up and ran to the altar. Now, now this particular church, they had a bottle of, of anointing oil on the altar. This witch ran to the altar, got on her knees, grabbed the anointing oil, pulled off the top and started drinking it. And I remember thinking in my mind, every devil in her sliding out right about now. So we started casting the devils out of her. Her arms had been emaciated, looked look like a meat grinder. Just like the prophets of Baal and Asher on Mount Carmel, when they were trying to get their gods to answer, they cut themselves, they bled in an attempt to get their God. She said she would take chunks of flesh and burn it as part of her prayers to Satan. So we got her saved. We got her filled with the Holy Spirit. So most people, now even before I became a Christian, if you'd said, hey man, you want to come join our witches coven? You want to be a Satanist? I'd have said, you are crazy. I may be on drugs, but I'm not that high. I wasn't down with that kind of stuff. I wasn't down to date a witch. I wasn't down to have my homie a Satanist. I wasn't down for that stuff. And most people aren't going to do that, right? But there are a lot of people, alarmingly, that do do that. So if he can't get you to do that, and by the way, that's, that's what, during the seven years of tribulation, it's called the abomination of desolation. And at the three and a half year mark, Satan, or the Antichrist, who is fully possessed with Satan at that point, will set himself up in the temple and tell everybody he's God, the whole world, and demand the world to worship him. That's what the battle is all about. All the way from, from when Lucifer wanted to be worshipped in heaven to when the first worshiper was murdered, all the way up until the very end of seven. That's what this is about. It's about the battle of, it's, it's about worship. And so, most people are not going to do that. So what the enemy's going to do, he's going to try to get you to stop worshiping altogether. Because if he can get you to stop worshiping, he can put out your fire. And if he puts out your fire, then you're subject to your own strength. It's the fire of God that gives you the supernatural power of God. And the enemy will try to get you to begin to worship things that are, that are not even God. You'll begin to worship things that God did use. You'll begin to hang on to things that God used, but it's not God. It's just something that God used. When revival broke out with King Hezekiah, they were worshiping something that God had actually used to bring deliverance to them when all the serpents were biting them and killing them. They were worshiping it. And when revival broke out, they said, they said That's, you, you, you're just worshiping a piece of common brass. And, and they beat that, that idol down to nothing more than dust. Every revival that breaks out, it only breaks out in the lives of people that are willing to destroy the idols that cling to their heart. If you're, willing, if you're not willing to get rid of your heart, I mean, get, get rid of your idols, out of your heart, you will not experience revival. And so as they destroyed the idols, revival broke out. And, and so the enemy will try to get you to stop worship altogether. Just don't be a worshiper. The fire will go out. Then you're left subject to your own strength and will, your own human power, and the enemy will take you captive. But then he will also, if he can't get you to stop worshiping, he'll try to pervert worship. He'll try to pervert it through the teachings and doctrines of men. Try to make the, the commandments of God of no effect in your life. He'll try to mess your heart up. He'll try to get you filled with pollution. He'll try to get you filled with, with bitterness and resentment and hatred. He'll try to fill you with unforgiveness. He'll try to wound you. He'll try to do things that will inflict pain upon your soul. 
He'll try to get people that he can use as an instrument. He'll use them to say things or do things to try to create pain in your life. He'll try to mess you up so that your worship isn't pure, so that you're filled with pain and hurt. That's why it's so important for you to get healed. Got to get your soul healed. Got to get your mind healed. Got to get your emotions healed. Got to get your life healed so that purity can flow out of you again. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I would that all men lift holy hands. Holy hands. Holy hands. Without wrath and without doubt. The enemy wants us to fight each other with our tongues. And so as we get conflict flowing among ourselves, strife and gossip and bitterness and backbiting flowing, We're trying to lift our hands, but our defilement's blocking us from a holy God. That's why the high priest had to have the crown that said holiness to the Lord for him to go into that most holy place. He had to have the crown on. He couldn't have that pollution in his mind because that pollution would stop him from going where he needed to go. It's It's hard to flow in purity toward God when your heart's full of uncleanness. Lift holy hands without wrath and without doubt. Because a lot of people begin to doubt the things of God when they don't get what they want, how they want it, when they want it, the way they think it. They ought to have it. They begin to doubt God. And people can doubt Him all day long if they want to. But I'm going to keep on believing God. I'm going to keep believing Him with you or without you. I'm going to keep trusting Him. I'm going to keep opening up this Word. I'm going to keep building my life on it. I'm going to keep allowing this word to be a light to my path and a, and a guide to my future. I'm going to use this word. I'm going to, I'm going to allow my, I'm going to, I'm going to come for you up here. I'm trying to tell you three things at one time. So some people, some people like, oh God, here, here's my will. Here's what I want to do, God. Here's how I want to serve you, God. You don't tell God what you're going to do. You're call, you don't tell God what your calling is. God tells you what your calling is. Oh, God, I'm, I'm gifted. I'm gifted here. Here's what I'm gifted at, God. You don't tell God what you're gifted at. God gives you your gifting. God, I, 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 I'm called to do this. I'm gifted to do this. I just need you to bless me and put your... That, that you, you're the center of your worship. It's when you surrender your life and you say, no longer my will be done, but your will be done. That's real work. You know what the greatest act of worship is? Lifting your hands is very, very, very important. Getting on your knees is very, very important. Laying before the Lord, very, very important. Opening up your heart and worshiping God, telling Him you love Him, allowing, allowing worship to flow out of you freely, expressing your love, your desire to know Him, to walk with Him. All that's very, very important. Very important. But none of that's going to flow out the way it should flow out if you don't ever surrender your life. The greatest act of worship is when you lay your life down. I, I'm not talking about just saying, Jesus, be my Savior. I'm talking about when you lay your life down and say, you're my Lord. You're my Master. It's no longer me that lives from this point forward. I'm not living for myself anymore. I, I'm not going to get to the end of my life and, and him say, you lived for you. You didn't live for me. I may not always get it right, but one thing I know, I'm going to lay my life down and say, God, I don't want to do my will. I want to do your will. The greatest act of worship is a surrendered life. It's where it all starts. Surrendered life. There are people in this room, you need to surrender your life. Wait a minute. I've given my life to Jesus, but you hadn't surrendered your whole life to Jesus. If we were to do an internal house check, if we were to do an inspection, Christy and I, years ago, we're going to rent a house. We were in the house, we were walking around, and there was a certain door in the house that had a lock on it, and it wouldn't open. I said, well, why won't this door open? They said, oh, we, we're going to keep some stuff that we have in this house. 
You say, I'm not renting no house with your stuff in the house. Sometimes we get the whole house where we're like, come over, look at the house. But we got that lock on that one area of our life. You don't, you don't need to look in there. Stuff you don't need to see. Have you surrendered your life? Have you really surrendered your life to Christ? There are people in this room, you le- he didn't come to condemn you. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. I mean, look, he, he came for a woman that had been married a bunch of times, y'all. She was living in adultery. He, he got into her world so she could get into his world. You know what she did? Her life was so changed that day. She ran back to the city, a new girl. Some guys saw her coming and probably thought it was their lucky day. But then all of a sudden, when she opened up her mouth and saw the countenance on her face... They got disappointed because she wasn't the same girl that seen the day before. Something to change. Something to change. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you. Will you let him save you today? Will you let him rescue you today? Will you let him wash away all your sins? Will you let him create a clean heart on the inside of you? Will you let him give you a new life? Will you let him transform you today? You're in this room. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You've never given your life to Jesus. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand, hold it up. Don't wait, don't delay, don't put it off. Today is a day of salvation. You're in this room, you've drifted away from God. You've got rooms in your life that you keep the door shut to. Keep it locked. You don't want anybody seeing what's in there. God knows what's in there. Nothing you're hidden from the eyes of the Lord. He said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you. Will you let him save you today? You're away from God. Maybe you drifted away. Maybe, you, maybe the enemy took you captive. Maybe the flesh rose up and you gave in and you started feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. Next thing you knew, spiritually, you've turned into nothing more than just ashes. Ashes. There's no fire. Ashes. Where are you? If you're not where you need to be with God, if you're not fully surrendered to the Lord, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand, hold it up, keep it there. When I count to three, today is the day of salvation. Hands are already going up. One, two, three. Raise them up right now. Raise them up. You got to get right with God. Raise them up. Raise them up. Raise them up. Raise them up like this is the last day you're ever going to live your life on this earth. If this was the last day you were ever going to live your life on, on this earth, would you raise your hand right now? If you knew before the day was over you were going to you were going to leave this life and stand before God, would you raise your hand up? That's how serious this salvation is. Because some people are going to procrastinate, put it off and put it off and put it off, and they had good intentions. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I didn't mean to end up here. Nobody means to end up in hell, but they're going to end up there. They ignore the grace of God, the love of God that comes knocking and reaching out and says, Stop, don't do that. Turn, give your life to me. Humble yourself before me. Recognize that I've come to save you. And, And they push it off and push it off. Don't push it off. Don't push off the love of God. Don't don't resist the grace of God that's reaching out to you. Don't resist the mercy of God. You raise your hand. Stand up right where you are. Stand up. Stand up. You raise your hand. Stand up. I want everybody in this room to stand up. You raise your hand. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come. I want to pray with you right here. I want you to, I want everybody else, turn to the person beside you. Ask them, do you need to go? They say yes. Say, come on, I'll take you right now. I'm going to wait on you. Ask them. Ask the person next to you. Say, do you need to go? They say yes. Say, come on, I'll go with you. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. You have to be putting your hands together. Giving God praise for what he's doing right now. Okay. Listen. One more time. Here comes a a whole bunch of people. 
I, I know there's more people that need to be up here. So good. I'm not trying to... Y'all, y'all just start praying in your heart. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But I got to talk to somebody out there. Even those that are joining us online. You need to give your life to Jesus today. The Bible says the day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Every time you reject God, every time you push him off, your heart gets harder, harder, harder. I talked to a guy one time. He said, I just wish God would deal with me one more time. He said, I'm an alcoholic, and God dealt with me. He said, I'd go to church. I was a secret alcoholic. And he said, I kept, I kept putting it off, pushing it off. Pushing. He said, one day, the Holy Spirit quit convicting me. One day, it, the Holy Spirit kept, quit dealing with me. And he said, I've lived this way for years now. He said, I just wish one more time God would deal with me. One more time. This may be your one more time. Do you need to get up here? Do you need to get up here? People are coming. People are coming. Somebody said, you ought to, you shouldn't do like, you shouldn't put so much pressure on people like that. Well, number one, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, give your life. He's begging people, begging people. Paul said, I'd give my life that my brethren could be saved if it was possible. There's nothing more important nothing more important if you get more excited over a personal prophecy than you do somebody being born again you need to get born again so beautiful people are getting right with God people are getting right see sometimes people just need help they just need help More people are coming. We're all going to pray together. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Say this prayer with me. Everyone, say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I believe you died on the cross. You were raised from the dead. In your life today, I want you to live in me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give you everything. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I lift them up. Lord, I lift up these men. I lift up these ladies. I pray, God, that 2 Corinthians 5, 17... All things pass away. All things become brand new. Wash away every sin. Wash away all defilement. Every bloodline generational curse broken by the power of the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. Every work of Satan is canceled. You have no dominion or authority over these people. These people have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. They are children of God. Father, I pray that you heal their hearts, heal their lives. Do miracles in their lives, God. I pray, God, that their lives would be forever marked, they'd be forever changed, that this day would be a day that forever changes them in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. So good. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I want you guys to do.